was a winter's night and business was slow. The girls in the red light district hoped their luck would improve. But for one, the fare she would take that night would be her last. The actions of the offender have been very methodical and deliberate. She identified that he had been a customer of hers. The person who did this was experienced in rope work and bondage. From that, we were advised that there was no match, so we had an unknown DNA sample. It was clear that his violence was escalating, and we did fear that we did have a serial killer on our hands. Can you tell us what you were doing on that day, or where you would have been? I've got no bloody idea. Stranger killings are one of the rarest and most difficult crimes to solve. So when a stranger kills twice, the pressure to find him before he strikes again is enormous. That was the challenge facing detectives and forensic officers of Task Force Midas. A body was found lying beside the Hendra police station in a vacant lot. It was discovered by a truck driver doing a U-turn. The body was that of a female. She was laying in the fetal position. She was dressed in a black top and a pair of ankle boots only. It could be seen that rigor mortis had set into the body, which indicated to us that she had perhaps been in that location and deceased for some four to six hours. She had obvious signs of stab wounds to her stomach and her back, and it appeared that her throat had been cut. The amount of blood found at the scene, to me, was not indicative of the injuries that had been suffered by the victim. That indicated to me that perhaps the primary crime scene was elsewhere and that this crime scene was a secondary crime scene and that being where the body was dumped. On the examination of the secondary crime scene, we located a, a set of tyre tracks which we believe drove up towards the direction of the body, appeared to do a U-turn and, and reverse back to where the body was and then drive away from the body. There was also a number of footprints from a uh, same, what would appear to be the same shoe. These footprints appeared to come from where you would expect the driver's door to be and moved around the body and then back to where you would expect the driver's door to be. We established that the footprints at the crime scene were not left by the truck driver. This suggested to us that uh, these tyre compressions and the footprints were more than likely the offenders. I took photographs of the shoe sole impressions and tyre track impressions in the future, we were hoping that we could match these up to a vehicle and to the footwear of a possible offender. We also took measurements of the um, width that the wheels are apart. We call this like an axle width. If we could locate a vehicle, we would compare these measurements to the wheels they have and also the axle length of the vehicle to hopefully positively identify that that vehicle had been at the scene. But in order to identify the offender and then put him, his car and shoes at the crime scene, the detectives needed to identify the victim first. We had nothing, no wallet or anything to assist us at the scene at the time, so I took digital photos of the deceased, and due to the clothing she was wearing, we had an idea that possibly she might have been from the Fortitude Valley area, which is the red light district of Brisbane. These photographs were sent into detectives in there, and they were able to give us a name of Jasmine Crathern, a known street worker there. Postmortem was conducted on the deceased and we located at least 14 stab wounds that we could clearly make out. Most of these stab wounds were probably around 2.5 centimetres wide. Some of them were up to 16 centimetres deep, which would indicate there was quite a grisly and aggressive attack on the deceased. The murder weapon was most likely around 15 to 17 centimetres in length, not a serrated edged weapon, more than likely a clean blade, possibly a clean blade on both sides, so therefore a dagger type weapon. With no defence injuries and the toxicology report indicating there were no drugs that would have caused Jasmine to become unconscious, it was more than likely this was a surprise attack. And because she was only partially clad, led us to believe that possibly the offender in this case could well have been a client or a customer. However, prostitutes, due to the nature of their work, they have a large client base, which leads us to a quite a large, or well, possibly large suspect pool to, to look at. So in order to narrow that field, 
as well as look at other possible suspects who may have known and wanted to kill Jasmine, detectives went to the red light district. Once it was explained to them that we weren't interested in their day-to-day -day activities, that we were interested in solving a murder of a, uh, a friend or an associate of theirs, they were more willing to speak to police. We discovered that in addition to the clothing that Jasmine was found in, she was also, prior to the incident, wearing a beige short miniskirt, a beige sports type jacket and carrying a black handbag. We also learnt that an associate by the name of Renee had also lent her a black top and we suspected that the black top was in fact hers. That top, along with Jasmine's boots, were currently being forensically examined to see whether any DNA from the offender could be found. But now that police knew what she was wearing that night, they hoped they might find her with her killer on footage from the various cameras around the valley. This footage was viewed. It was a quite time-consuming task, uh, however important task. And from this footage, we were able to obtain one sighting of Jasmine at the BP service station. But in this one sighting, Jasmine was alone. It was 8.32 p.m and police knew she would meet her killer in the next three to eight hours. And one suspect had just emerged. Our inquiries in relation to this male person found that he had just recently been released from prison, uh, in fact, for a very serious stabbing assault. Police investigating the murder of 41-year-old sex worker Jasmine Crathurn say she was stabbed up to 20 times. So, in, in all in all, it's a very frenzied attack. Her semi-clad body was found by a truck driver in a vacant lot on Thursday. Detectives investigating the case believe she was murdered elsewhere. Tire marks in the dirt where Ms Crathurn's body was found are being examined. In relation to the tire impressions found at the scene, unfortunately there was no database concerning uh, tire types. It was the case that we went door to door to tyre manufacturers in the possibility of uh, locating that tyre. These initial inquiries we were unsuccessful in identifying the tyre. However, from the base characteristics of the tyre, the tread pattern was more than likely what they referred to in the tyre industry as a highway tread. And this was used generally on light commercial vehicles, in particular utilities and vans. Detectives then turned their attention to the shoe impression. We sent photographs to a police officer who maintained a database in relation to many types of shoes and styles and that sort of thing. This shoe impression was then identified to us as a T-boot, which is a common work boot used by many different people. We then contacted the distributor or the sales rep for T-boot in the Brisbane area. She then provided us with certain information, namely that that sole pattern on that shoe impression had been around for some 30 years. So therefore the possibility of tracing any T-boot was going to be a dead end in regards to further inquiries However, it may provide us with a good point of reference should a person of interest be located down the track. One such person had just been nominated. Information was obtained that a previous boyfriend of Jasmine's had treated her badly in the past. We conducted a number of inquiries in relation to this person and it was from these inquiries we established that he had committed a uh, previous murder. Obviously this aroused our suspicion. He was uh, located and extensively interviewed. As a result of this interview, he was eliminated from our inquiries based on a number of reasons. Namely, he had a solid alibi in relation to the time frame that we had established. And further, that in relation to the tyre impressions and the shoe impressions found at the scene, none of these could be linked back to him in any way that we could discover at that stage. Another suspect came to our attention through information obtained by prostitutes from working in the Fulltrude Valley area. Uh, this information related to a male person who was currently standing over a number of the girls as well as assaulting them and dealing drugs. Our inquiries in relation to this male person found that he had just recently been released from prison, uh, in fact for a very serious stabbing assault. However, like the ex-boyfriend, this standover man was eliminated from inquiries. He too had an alibi that checked out, and his footwear and car tyres didn't match the impressions left at the crime scene. But detectives now had a further piece of forensic evidence to add to their list of criteria. We were advised that a uh, DNA sample had been obtained from a semen stain located on the top that Jasmine Crathurn was wearing at the time she was located. We believed that uh, this semen stain was more than likely to come from a client 
we hoped that this client would also be the offender. That DNA sample was then compared to DNA samples that are contained on the DNA database. From that, we were advised that there was no match, so we had an unknown DNA sample. We located a number of regular clients that uh, used the services of Jasmine. Uh, DNA was also taken from all of these regular clients voluntarily, and all of these regular clients were eventually eliminated as persons of interest. There were two possible scenarios that Jasmine was either killed by a person that she knew or by a stranger, a client that she just met on that night. At this time of the investigation, we were fairly confident that we had spoken to most of Jasmine's male associates and had eliminated them as being possible suspects. So it led us to believe that we were more than likely looking at a stranger, someone that wasn't known to Jasmine, a client that she had met that night. Police investigators converged on Deepwater Bend Reserve where the woman's body was found by council workers at 7.30 this morning. Now, six months later, it appeared another sex worker may have met that same client. She was sort of bound, face down, and um, could see stab wounds. The workers used their own perimeter tape to cordon off the area. Thought we'd better restrict, restrict the area, obviously, the crime scene. Police believe the body hadn't been there long. We are, every likelihood is that uh, the person's only been here some hours. The body was located lying face down in the car park. The body was completely naked except for a sandal that was on her left foot. There were a number of stab wounds to her back, her chest and her side. A digital image was obtained of the deceased's fingerprint and she was identified as a 42-year-old Brisbane prostitute by the name of Julie McCullum. She had a number of ropes that were tied around her legs, her waist, her hands, and she was also wearing uh, what appeared to be a blindfold and a gag. Julie McColl had been stabbed 24 times, and like Jasmine Crithern, a number of those wounds were 16 centimetres deep. But this time, the actions of the killer weren't as frenzied. The ropes hadn't been damaged in any way, which showed to me that the actions of the offender had been very methodical and deliberate. However, those undamaged ropes were providing a possible lead. Knowing the way that the ropes had been tied and the work that Julie did indicated to us that bondage may have been used and that the person using these ropes was experienced in bondage. Now, we were of the opinion that these were the property of the murderer. It wouldn't be items typically carried around by a prostitute waiting for a potential bondage client. And we believe that a scientific examination of those might lead us to the owner of those items and potentially the killer. We learned from our inquiries that the rope that was used to tie up jelly was a uh, multi-plat braid cotton type rope, which is a fairly common type of rope. And on the end of the piece of rope which was used to tie her wrist, there was uh, what are referred to as rope end clips, which are placed on the end of the rope to prevent fraying. While the rope was common, the good news for detectives was that this rope could not be bought with these rope clips attached. They had been crimped with a tool. We then had the future potential to find the tool which had been used to crimp those based on the impressions that the tool left. But like the tyres and shoe impressions in the Jasmine Crithern case, it was a matter of finding the suspect first. And a discarded check that had been found right next to Julie's body was their next point of call. There's a motive here for this guy. I mean, here he is using the services of this woman and now she's robbed him of his money. When Julie McCoy was found dead, uh, I immediately feared the worst. Uh, I was actually at home and got a telephone call and I immediately had a sinking feeling in my stomach that we had the same offender who'd struck again. I knew how difficult it had been in relation to the first investigation of Jasmine's murder and uh, I thought to myself, here we go again. When the area surrounding the victim at Deepwater Bend Reserve was searched, there were no shoe and tie print evidence found. This may have been due to the fact that it was raining on the night of the offence. However, right near the body, we located a scrunched up check. We were able to see that it was a personal check. This, we thought, was a great breakthrough in the case because it gave us an opportunity to identify who may have last been with the victim. The owner of the check was identified. His premises were placed under surveillance. Excuse me, sir. Upon him returning to his premises, he was interviewed at length. 
He provided details of his contact with the deceased Julie and he said in a period prior to her murder he had used her services as a prostitute and that during that time he had been potentially drugged and had some checks stolen from him. This then gave us a thought of, well, there's their motive here for this guy. I mean, here he is using the services of this woman and now she's robbed him of his money. However, he provided an alibi as to his movements on the night before and we were able to verify this was the case. Now, we were also able to find out that the version he provided with regard to the theft of his checks was, in fact, true. So at that stage, we really didn't have a lot more to go on, uh, but he certainly wasn't uh, out of the picture as such. We just needed to make further inquiries in other avenues. Normally, they walk these streets in darkness waiting for business to come to them, but fears they're being targeted by a serial killer who grabs his victims at night has them scared. I mean, it could be any guy out here, we don't know. There's plenty of weirdos and, I mean, just safer during the day. When Julie was found, of course, there was a lot of uh, media in relation to the death. The media were talking about the fact that it might have been a serial killer. Our worst fears was the fact that there could be a person out there who was killing street workers. We now had two women who'd been murdered violently, stabbed to death in a space of six months, and it was quite possible that um, there was a person out there who uh, could strike. So we decided that the most effective way to investigate this murder and the still unsolved murder of Jasmine Crathurn was to set up a dedicated task force. Uh, it was codenamed Task Force Midas, and it was set up trying to solve these two murders and to look back at two other attacks on street workers in 1998. This was the uh, murder of Elizabeth Henry and the serious bashing of Karen Redmile. Initially, each investigation will stand alone. And at this stage, it's too early to make a comment as to whether we're looking at one person involved or a number. One fellow street walker believed she may have the answer, at least to Julie's murder. Jacinda thought she may have been the last person to see her friend alive and to have met her killer. Jacinda told us that at about 2.30 on that morning, she'd had a conversation with Julie on Brunswick Street in Fortitude Valley. They had a discussion about how quiet the night was, the weather, etc. About 20 minutes later, Jacinda was approached by a man. She had a conversation with him during which he asked for something a little bit different, and he then elaborated and said that he wanted to tie her up. Jacinda uh, was not interested in this person's request. She then got out of the vehicle. The male person drove off and said to her, I might be back. Sometime after that, Jacinda walked down to see where Julie was working and found that she was no longer there. Jacinda described the driver of the vehicle as male, obviously, Caucasian, fair-skinned, approximately 40, 45 years old, overweight, with a beer gut, uh, a moustache, a fat, chubby face, and wearing a navy blue polo shirt of some description. Her street savvy had allowed police to compile a comfit of this suspect. She then went on to describe the car. Jacinda described the car as a fairly new uh, two-wheel drive twin cab utility because she stated to me that when she sat in the front passenger seat, she could place her left leg on the bitumen, which she said wasn't consistent with sitting in a four-wheel drive. She described that it had a matching canopy. It was the same colour as the body of the vehicle. And she also said that it had a Queensland registration plate. Police then went through the same process they had with Jasmine Crathurn and obtained all the security vision in the area to see if they could identify the utility and, more importantly, its number plate. With a stroke of luck, we found a car, similar in description, that drove through the valley that night. The vehicle was spotted three times on these tapes and we thought, here we go, we're onto something here. But due to the quality of the video footage, and also uh, it was raining, we weren't able to identify a registration number or the make and model or the type of vehicle it may be. We then went about a number of the north side car dealerships with the photos to show these dealership owners to see if they could identify the type of car involved. A general consensus after a variety of makes and models were put forward was that it was more than likely a Mitsubishi Triton, 1996 to 2001 model, MK Triton. When those working on the Jasmine Crathurn case learned about this find, they were extremely interested. And while they had yet to identify the tyre that had left the impression at the crime scene, they did know that it was likely made from one that was on a ute. The track width of the Mitsubishi Triton was compared to the track width of the left at the Crathurn crime scene and they were found to be very similar. 
And this was a further indication to us that it was extremely possible that the two murders were in fact linked. It was more than likely that we were looking at one offender for both murders. Police believed that Julie McColl's killer was driving this Mitsubishi Ute. The vehicle was caught on camera only 90 minutes after Julie was seen walking the streets. They also believed the driver was responsible for the murder of Jasmine Crithern six months earlier. Detectives on that case had discovered that the width between the tyres of this model Mitsubishi Ute was the same as that found at Jasmine's crime scene. It was encouraging news, but they still needed to find the tyres that made the impression. As we already made inquiries with the major manufacturers, we decided to look at other avenues. These avenues led us to retreaders. They indicated to us that um, it wasn't a retread tyre at all, and that perhaps it was a cheap imported tyre. We attended at one particular importer. We asked the manager if we could possibly walk through the warehouse just to examine some tyres there, because at this stage we knew the tread pattern of our tyre inside out and back to front. Whilst walking through the warehouse, we discovered the tyre. And it was a uh, Chinese imported tyre. It had only been imported into Australia since the year 2000. That only a couple of thousand had actually been imported and sold. And that this manager was the only person who imported that tyre into Australia. After several months of being quite frustrated with our investigation, we finally obtained a piece of evidence which we may be able to use to identify our offender. So as detectives Paskin and Ryan began to go through the 2,000 or so possible buyers of the tyre, back at the McColl investigation, a list of several hundred registered Mitsubishi Tritons had been identified. The only problem was there was no way of telling whether the ute was a two-wheel drive with a dual cab as seen in the security vision. So we were looking for ways that we could narrow that field. The security footage also indicated to us that the vehicle had a number of non-manufacturer features to it, and that included very distinctive pinstriping down the side, and there was a CB aerial that was discernible. There were also fog lights on the vehicle and a small nudge bar and a flexiglass canopy on the back that was in the same colour as the vehicle. And we used these features to develop a criterion to recognise the vehicle. Our primary focus was on vehicles to the north of Brisbane, and that was essentially because the two dump sites for the two bodies were adjacent to the Gateway Arterial Road that heads north from the Brisbane River right through to the Sunshine Coast. So as they headed back one day from checking out vehicles on the north side, they noticed a utility driving towards them on the opposite side, heading back to that crucial area. It had all the extra features police had been looking for. At that point, we attempted to pursue the vehicle, but by the time we could get to an exit and get to the opposite side of the road, um, the vehicle um, had gone. Meanwhile, Mitsubishi Australia were able to provide police with information to distinguish which Tritons were two-wheel drive dual cab utilities. The list of suspect vehicles was now dramatically reduced to 160 in Queensland and to 26 in the focal area north of Brisbane. And amongst those was one vehicle. I conducted checks in relation to that vehicle and discovered that a fellow by the name of Francis Michael Fahey had been ticketed in that vehicle. I conducted checks in relation to Mr Fahey and established that um, sometime previous he had um, been convicted of a work cover uh, fraud offence and a prison photo existed of him. I managed to obtain a copy of that photo and I compared it to a confit likeness that had been prepared by an eyewitness and saw that there were similarities. We then proceeded out to the Narangbar address where we observed, sitting in the driveway, a grey MK Triton that clearly had the pinstriping that we were looking for, CB aerial, and that it had other features, including the grey canopy, consistent with the colour of the vehicle. Because the vehicle was facing towards the garage, we were unable to see whether it had fog lights or the nudge bar on the front, but we were satisfied that that was the vehicle that was depicted in that CSA footage. We proceeded back to headquarters and put mechanisms in place to have the vehicle put under surveillance. During surveillance of Faye, we were able to determine that he did frequent the Deepwater Bend Reserve at Bald Hills, where Julian McColl was located. 
And on one such occasion, a surveillance team was able to see that in his vehicle was a pair of T-boots. Detectives then began inquiries to confirm whether Francis Faye could be the owner of those T-boots. With this genuine suspect now in their sights, they didn't want to blow their chances by jumping in too early and speaking with him without collecting as much evidence as they could. It was established that uh, Francis Faye used to work for the Queensland Ambulance Service. Inquiries made with the sales rep for T-Boots ascertained that at one point in time T-Boots were supplied to the Queensland Ambulance. Investigations were then conducted in relation to Faye spending some time in the Rockhampton jail and they subsequently sent us through a list of all his property that he had on him at the time of him being incarcerated. On this list, it could clearly be seen that at the time of Faye's incarceration, he had in his possession and was wearing a pair of T-boots. Information was then received from surveillance team that the tyres located on Faye's vehicle were in fact the same Chinese import tyre that we had located the tread of at our crime scene of Jasmine Crathurn. As a result of this, investigators became more and more confident that the murders of Julie McColl and Jasmine Crathurn were in fact linked, as we had thought. At this point in the investigation, we had established that Faye owned and wore T-boots, that he had Chinese import tyres on his vehicle that matched our crime scene, that he had knowledge of the Deepwater Bend area, the only piece of the puzzle that remained outstanding for us at this point in regards to investigations was the DNA. At this point, we placed Faye under surveillance, and as a result, a discarded cigarette butt from Faye was seized by police and subsequently analysed. As a result of this being analysed, it was found that the DNA was a perfect match to that located on the shirt of Jasmine Crathun. Detectives then returned to speak to the prostitute who they believed had loaned Jasmine the T-shirt. They needed to check if she had worn that T-shirt while working and whether Francis Faye was a client of hers, which could possibly explain why his semen was on it. But Renee had realised that the T-shirt was not hers. And while the story she was about to tell police never made it beyond a committal hearing, it was important evidence at the time. Talking to Renee in relation to the shirt, that uh, we stumbled upon the fact that Renee uh, had had a near-death experience herself in relation to a client. Renee was shown a photo board, which also included a picture of Faye, and she identified that he had been a customer of hers in early 2002. That was six months before Jasmine was murdered. Renee told us that she had been picked up by Faye whilst working as a prostitute in uh, Brunswick Street, Fortitude Valley, and that he had driven her to a location on the north side of Brisbane. She stated that they had sexual intercourse in his motor vehicle, and as she was about to redress herself, Faye produced a pair of handcuffs. I identified himself as a officer with the Australian Taxation Department, and that she was under arrest. And he tried to handcuff her within the motor vehicle. She was able to escape. Faye followed her in his motor vehicle and attempted to run it down. When investigators learned about the incident with Renee, it became clear that Francis Faye's violence uh, was increasing uh, every six months. Uh, initially, with Renee, where he tried to run her over. After that, there was the murder of Jasmine, where she was stabbed 14 times. After that, there was the murder of Julie, where she was stabbed up to 22 times. Uh, it was clear that his violence was escalating. It was now three months since Julie's murder, and police felt they had sufficient evidence to ensure no other prostitute would meet the same fate. A warrant was obtained for Faye's arrest and his house searched for further evidence. Up to 50 officers moved in at 5.30 this morning executing search warrants. The precise raids were orchestrated by Task Force Midas. It's the special team investigating the murders of Fortitude Valley streetwalkers Julie McColl, Elizabeth Henry and Jasmine Crathurn and the attempted murder of Karen Ann Redmile. We are interviewing the occupants of the house those people uh, assisting police with their inquiries and continue to do so at this time. Mate, we're part of Task Force Midas and that task force is investigating 
deaths of a number of prostitutes from the Fortitude Valley area over a period of time from 19... 98 onwards. Do you understand that? Yeah. All right. Once we had arrived back at police headquarters, we participated in a record of interview with Faye about the murders of the prostitutes. He was quite calm and calculating during the interview. Mate, on the way in, in the car, you tell me that you are a regular visitor to the valley area. No, I haven't been yet. All right. With regards to the valley, he indicated that he had been to the valley uh, at late at night uh, as he was concerned for a family member who had been frequent in the valley. And as far as I was aware, it was originally she wasn't getting any money from Social Security, so she had to be getting the money from somewhere. Um, my first thoughts are that when, because she was going down the valley, that um, she was what they call a working girl. Did you get any response from the working girls? No. I think you told me some were a bit pissed off when they found out you weren't a customer. Yeah. Right. And you told me in the car that you've never been a customer of the prostitutes down there in the valley. No. And you don't know uh, Jasmine Grathurn or Julie McColl, who were two prostitutes who were working down there. No. And uh, as I recall, you said that on occasion, or at least one occasion or two occasions, the girls actually sat in the vehicle and talked with you. Is that right? There was a couple of rainy nights there, yeah. I mean, um, I'm not an arsehole, if you know what I mean. I no. mean, if somebody comes up and, I mean, um, and wants to chat, that's fine. I mean, they, they can sit in the car um, because I'm there to find out what's happening with my stepdaughter. It became quite apparent that the explanation being provided by Faye was that, well, we must have known he was in the valley hence why he provided a version as to why he's in the valley. And should we locate anything in his vehicle that may be linked to a prostitute, he gives this explanation of how if it was raining, they would sit inside his vehicle. Well, I told him, you know, not interested. But I said, you know, could you do me a favour? And they sort of look at me, and we don't do anything, any favours. I said, well, I explained who I was looking for. And um, they uh, said, no, we haven't seen him. Do you recall anything else that was said to them, or they said to you? Um, I was actually told what the prices were there at one stage. <laughs> and they vary. During the interview with Faye, he also openly admitted to attending Deepwater Bend, being the other crime scene. He would uh, talk about the fact that he would go there fishing. So where do you put in, if you're going to fish the Pine River, where do you put in from? I put in at um, Deepwater Bend. I prefer to stick to the more sheltered waters. Yep. We usually find the fishing dam site better. I like to fish in spots away from the fucking idiots on their jet skis and, and the water skiers. So I stay around those areas. This again was a way of him trying to show that, well, OK, the police know I must have been there. Well, the reason I've been there is because I go fishing there. What Faye didn't know was how much evidence the police already had and how much more was building since they entered his house. Just cast your mind back to the end of February, around about the 26th of February. That's when um, Julie McColl was murdered on the 26th. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you tell us what you were doing on that day or where you would have been? I've got no bloody idea. Um, none whatsoever. No what, what day of the week is it? It's a Wednesday morning. So it's a Tuesday night, Wednesday morning sort of thing. On well, Tuesday night I would have been home, I suppose, watching um, Law and Order if it was on. Francis Fay had been in custody for nearly four hours. And at no time had he flinched in terms of his guilt. Her name's Jasmine Grathurn. Never ever seen her before, no. Police already had a strong body of evidence against him for the two murders. But they hoped they would find more in his house. Mate, we've just got to wait for a little bit longer to get some results on some tests and that. And, you know, they could be done by now. Mm -hmm. And it's just... It won't be much longer, but we'll just have to suspend the interview, mate. Right? Mm -hmm. One of the very first things that we saw was a set of T-boots. In fact, there were two sets of T-boots at the front door of the house. These were taken away for scientific analysis. 
The dimensions of the shoe, the size of the shoe, the scuff and wear marks on the tread pattern match perfectly to the shoe prints left in the dust beside Jasmine's body. A drop of blood was found on the left T-boot. This blood was subsequently analysed and matched to that of Jasmine Crathurn. We found a boat in the garage. The boat had an outboard motor and tied around the outboard motor was a rope. The rope was found to be of exactly the same construction and the same material as the ropes found tying up Julian McCall's body. And the rope was also crimped with metal crimps on the end of the rope. Also, we found a crimping tool. Impressions from the crimping tool were placed into lead and the identifying marks in the lead were then compared by a microscope with the marks left on the crimps that were attached to the ropes that tied up Julie McCall's wrist. These crimp marks were found to be an identical match. But the most beneficial evidentiary thing we found in Francis Faye's house was a bayonet. The dimensions of this weapon were consistent with the wounds that were caused to both Julie and Jasmine. During the search of the house, there was a lengthy break between two of the interview tapes, and this is when a lot of the main information was coming in. I never smoke one other cup of coffee or a glass of water. Another glass of water. We feel at that time that Faye was having problems, you know, sticking to this story. He must have known that we were getting a lot of evidence that could link him to these crimes, and it was beginning too much for him to bear. It was at this stage that Faye summonsed us back to the interview room. Mate, a short time ago, I was called back into the room. I was told that she wanted to speak to me. Yep. Mate, um, what is it you want to talk about on this occasion? <sighs> I just want to get a lot of shit off my chest. Mate, is it in relation to the matters that we have spoken to earlier this morning? Yep, two, two only. And that's um, the one at Hendra and the one at um, Deepwater Bend. Faye then started to talk about the death of Jasmine Crithern. He indicated how he picked her up in the valley that night. When this bird jumped in and one of the know if I wanted any company. And I said, yeah, I don't mind if the company. And she told me what the prices were, $50 for a blow job. And it kind of appealed to me, so I agreed. And we drove into a vacant lot. Um, she wanted to be um, paid first up, and um, so I paid her the 50 bucks, and um, we walked to the back of the car, and um, we had oral sex, uh, the condom broke, and um, next thing I recall is that I'm hooking along the bloody gateway to the fucking Great Road of Knots. Um, the other one, I pulled up there at the, um, the Night Owl place. I got a cup of coffee from there and I think I got a, something to eat. I can't remember what I had to eat. I pulled into a side street. I think it was on the right-hand side, heading back towards the wall. Pulled up there to, to finish my coffee. And I got a tap on the window and, um, who was offering different services and what have you. She offered to give me a blade job for 25 bucks, I think it was. And um, she sat in the car with me while I was um, finishing my coffee and she started, you know, talking about um, what turned me on, that sort of stuff, and that led to the bondage thing. And then, then she suggested that um, we go back to her place. I said, no, I wouldn't be in that, in that, um, uh, I wouldn't feel safe. And um, the only place I could think of was deep water men, and I told her about it, and she agreed to go. With this sort of weather, she said, I'm not going to get much business tonight. We, we drove to there, and um, I remember tying her up. I remember getting the uh, blow job. And you see, I remember I pulled up on the side of the road underneath the bridge. And I'm using these um, drink bottles and cordial bottles to wash blood off my legs. And I threw my guts up when we were doing that. Both of these women have died from stab wounds? Yeah. Mate, can you tell me how these stab wounds came to be inflicted? Well, I obviously stabbed them, but I don't, I don't have much recollection about it at all. 
Do you recall what you did it with? When was the bail plan in the car? We used to use that years ago for, um, when I was picking. It was good to kill them. The pig, you know. Mate, I showed you these two photos earlier and you said you didn't recognise them. I'm now going to show you two photos again. That's Julie McColl. Mate, and that's Jasmine Prithern. So they still don't mean anything to me. Well, obviously, they are the two women involved. But, um, yeah, I've never sort of looked at them that much. Didn't really care. During the investigation and interview, police were able to discount Faye being involved in the murder of Elizabeth Henry and what has now become since her death, the murder of Karen Redmill. These murders remain unsolved. Frances Faye was charged with two counts of murder in relation to the deaths of Jasmine Crathern and Julie McColl. The trial was held in September 2005 and ran for three weeks. Francis Fay chose not to call evidence or give evidence uh, on his own behalf. Uh, the jury was out for uh, six hours and returned uh, a guilty of verdict in relation to both counts of murder. Francis Fay was sentenced to two life imprisonments to be served concurrently. He must serve a minimum of 25 years, which means he will be eligible for parole in 2028. The verdict was welcomed by investigators who helped put Queensland's second convicted serial killer behind bars. We hope now there's some closure for the families that were involved in what has been a uh, very difficult investigation. Faye's shoe prints were found at the scene of Crathern's murder. Forensic testing matched the prints to Queensland ambulance issue boots. It was somewhat prophetic that the task force was codenamed Midas because everything we touched did turn to gold in terms of the evidence. From a forensic perspective, I think this was the perfect investigation. I think every piece of evidence that we uncovered um, gave us a result. It's extremely satisfying to the task force members and uh, the whole police service that Francis Fay was convicted of these murders. I've got no doubt that if he hadn't been convicted, uh, he would have continued to offend. Do you feel any better or not? To a certain degree, I do. To a certain degree, I don't. I mean, don't know why it happened. I don't know why it happened. Um, because it's, it's, you know, I spent all my fucking life saving lives. Mm. You know. Now, twice a week, Criminal Minds, Monday 9.40 and Wednesday. This is the woman convicted of 13 murders. And this is the man who helped her. Sarah G! On death row, with 35 hours left to live, they're guilty as sin. Any last words? Bring it on. So why is Mandy Patinkin so desperate to save her? Criminal Minds, Monday 9.40 on 7.